Rock Sound Church family, to those that may be coming in for our Bible study virtually. Uh, it's good to be here today. We'll give a couple of minutes to let a few more people come in uh, this evening for Bible study. I thank God for today, uh, bringing us to the close of the day. And what better way to close it than in the Word of God? Just a praise report as others are coming in tonight. Uh, Tony Smith is doing well. Uh, still having a little pain, but we're praying God for her recovery. Uh, she went to the doctor in Birmingham and, and things are looking well. Uh, it appears now that she may not have to even have surgery on her shoulder. So we just need to praise God for our victories, big or small. Uh, I thank God for what he's doing in her life in this season right now uh, in her recovery process. So we just all praise God for that as a church family. And as I always say, when one of us is going through, all of us are going through. So let's continue to keep her lifted in prayer uh, as, as we go forward this evening, uh, that the Lord will continue to strengthen her and her family and that she continues to have good progress in her recovery. Uh, as, as we go forward tonight, I want to continue over in chapter 3 of uh, Genesis. We were dealing with that first spiritual warfare, that first battle that occurred with Adam and Eve and the serpent there in the garden. Uh, just five things I want to pull from that tonight. As, as we go forward, I'm not going to hold you long on a long lesson, but I, I got five things I want to quickly cover tonight. Uh, just some insights from what we talked about last week. Hopefully, uh, you're keeping good notes. Uh, we're talking about overall subject matter. We're talking about defining our warfare. Spiritual warfare is real. And every week I consistently, consistently uh, just reinforce that. The enemy is always looking for a way to creep into the life of the believer, to, to dislocate and separate him from God. So if you've been keeping up, keeping good notes, if you need to go back and review some past lessons as, as refreshers, I'm going to constantly... Uh, just encourage you to do that because it's very vital that you get a, a, a better understanding of your warfare and, and what you're facing when you've decided to make God your choice. Hopefully, at this point, we're in line with God. We've decided to have an intimate relationship with him. And as part of that, you can expect the enemy to show up. Uh, tonight, as we go forward, as, as we consider spiritual warfare, uh, there are several matters which are seen throughout the Bible. Satan always presents himself, and consistently, one thing that we can give him credit for is that he's consistent in his approach to spiritual warfare. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That has not changed down through the ages. So he's consistent in his approach to spiritual warfare. Tonight, uh, the first thing that I, I, I want to say to you, the first thing is that Satan came disguised as a serpent. He, he has a way of, of, of disguising himself. Let's, let's not look for a, a, a devil with a red tail and horns, uh, this, this character that somebody has created. Most times when you say, say Satan, we think about that devil with the tail and a red suit with horns, but that's, that's so far from the truth because Satan is a spiritual creature. He's spiritual, so he can take on disguises. He can come in, in, in the shape of the believer. He can come looking as a human being. Uh, and it's proven even in Genesis, he came as, as a serpent. He was disguised as a serpent. Paul warned in the New Testament, 
He warned a Corinthian church that, that came, Satan sometimes camouflages himself, even as an angel of light, over in 2 Corinthians there in the 11th chapter. He, he, he talks about how Satan can come looking like an angel of light. And, and we have to be aware that Satan is not afraid to come in the presence of believers. The enemy is not afraid of a building of bricks and mortar. There's no power in the bricks and mortar. The sanctuary houses no power. It's a gathering place for worship for the believers. The church is in the heart of the believer. So it's easy for you to have people who would gather in the sanctuary on Sunday, but it's also easy for the enemy to come in and sit in the sanctuary on Sunday. So we have to be mindful of that in our spiritual warfare. He's not afraid to come in the sanctuary. He knows the word of God. He knows when it's in order. He knows when it's out of order, but he's always looking for a, a, a crease. And I didn't say a crack, I said a crease. If he can get a crease to come in, that's where he's coming to try to bring disorder and chaos. But Paul reminded us, as he reminded the Corinthian church in the New Testament, that he can come looking as an angel of light. Matthew said that he can come like a raging uh, wolf in sheep's clothing over in Matthew 7. And, and Peter says Satan is a roaming lion, seeing who he can divide. So it, it, his appearance can change, it can alter, it can, it can look like your friend. Satan can come in disguise and the influence of a friend, but ultimately he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. In John 10 and 10, John describes him as a thief. So we, we all know by now what a thief does. A, a thief will try to hide his identity. He doesn't want you to know who he is, but he comes to do damage. If you've ever had your house broken into or your car broken into and you find it the next day, and you don't know who did it, but you know somebody's been there. That's how Satan comes. He comes to do damage. He comes to take something from you. But when you look around, you don't see him, but you know something has happened. And we have to be aware of that in our lives, that his image can change. It, it, it's, it's one that he can camouflage himself. He's not the little red man or a, a red figure with a tail and horns that we see depicted so often. But he, he is an image bearer. But he can change his image to have influence on us as believers. And that's what we have to be careful of. Even in Genesis 3, Adam had authority over the garden. He named every creature. When he saw this serpent who was walking upright, you, you, you need to hear me now. This is a serpent, a snake walking upright at this time in the garden. He had authority to speak to him. He had authority over him, but he failed to exercise his authority. I want somebody to hear this today. As children of God, we have authority over the enemy in Jesus' name, but we got to use our authority in Jesus' name. We can't do it under our own power. We have to do it under the Lord's power. So when we look in chapter 3 and we see this serpent who's walking upright, and, and as I was preparing for tonight, I thought about the, the, the commercial, the insurance commercial with the little Geico on there, that little serpent walking upright who talks uh, just the depictment of, of our enemy. I'm saying to you, could you imagine what Adam saw in a serpent that was walking upright? Uh, and part of the curse was that the Lord cursed him that he would have to crawl on his belly for the rest of his life. And, and here it is for us today. We've got to understand Satan's still walking upright. He may not be a serpent, but he's still walking upright. Maybe that'll help somebody along the way. Everybody that comes into your presence is not always working on your behalf. And 
you need to understand that spiritual warfare is real. Satan has the ability to influence. He has the ability to disguise himself. He has the ability to try to lure you into a position where you will ultimately come against God of your own free will. We have to be careful of that. The second thing is that God's victory is established in the very beginning. God's victory is established in the very beginning. God was uh, sovereign over the serpent. And this is seen through the punishment that he levies against the serpent. In Genesis 3 and 15, God announces the ultimate victory at the fall. Here it is. Satan was able to deceive Adam and Eve, but God still was sovereign over all creation. So he has the right to levy punishment against the enemy. Here it is for us today in 2022. God is still sovereign over our enemy. We still have the victory through Jesus Christ for what Christ did for us to atone for our sins. He paid the price that no one else could pay, that we could not pay ourselves. He paid it way back then, knowing what the future held. He did it all for us on Calvary. I thank him today for being the Savior, but more than that, I thank him for being sovereign, that he took reign over all creation. And here it is today for us. We've got to understand in our spiritual warfare as children of God, as believers, we have to stand on the authority of Jesus Christ that was established on Calvary that gives us victory over the enemy. Mm -hmm. We have the right to tell the enemy to flee. We have the right to tell him to get behind us. We have the right to rebuke him because of the authority of Jesus Christ. So God's victory is established from the very beginning in this, in this spiritual warfare where Adam and Eve was involved because God was sovereign and he was able to pronounce the curse or the punishment over the serpent. So that's important to know that from the very beginning, God never took a back seat. God always stepped to the forefront to let the enemy know that he was a sovereign God, that none was greater than him. The servant had no reason to believe that he had more power than God. God pronounced punishment over him, yeah. and he leveled it out, even against Adam and Eve for their wrongdoing. But here it is, God is still yet merciful. Yeah. So when we find ourselves tricked by Satan, by the enemy, we got to understand that we have a sovereign God who's assured us a victory through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Then thirdly, Adam and Eve, here it is. Thirdly, Adam and Eve's sin demonstrates the absolute necessity of knowing God's word. Eve handled the word of God lightly. Right. She, she paraphrased some stuff and she took it out of context but here it is. That's why today is so important that you stay in the Word, that you study the Word for yourself, you read the Word for yourself, so you don't get caught in a position because the enemy knows the Word. Satan knows the Word. So he'll come to you with the Word, but he's going to come to you with the Word, and he's going to allow you to mishandle the word. He's not going to correct you. He's waiting for you to mishandle the word. Just as Eve mishandled the word, she knew exactly what the Lord said in his word, and that's what she should have quoted or said to say exactly what God had told them. So you can't afford to, in spiritual warfare, to handle the word of God haphazardly. You need to be in it you need to understand it, and you need to have a command of it. So when the enemy comes forth and he challenges you on the word of God, you can stand on what God said. Not what you think, but what you know God said in his word. And the only way you can get to that place is that you're spending adequate time 
in reading the Word of God. There are some promises in there that you need to know. There are some assurances that you need to know. Because all Satan wants to do is to create doubt. If he can come into your life in any shape, form, or fashion and say one simple word to you, just as he did with Adam and Eve. If he can say, surely, surely God didn't mean what he said. You got to be strong enough and firm enough in the word that you can look the enemy dead in the eye and say that God said it, I believe it, and I know he meant it. You got to be able to stand on God's word for exactly what it says. Same strategy is to distort the word of God. That's why you have to be careful when you're having conversations with people. And I won't just say believers. I'm saying with people because there are people who have not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they swear they know the word of God. It's dangerous when you start having these conversations with people who don't know the Lord for themselves, who have no plan of being in a relationship with him. Then they become the enemy quoting the word. And you need to be careful. That's spiritual warfare. When a non-believer can take the word of God and quote it to you and use it to try to convince you that God didn't mean what he said when he said it, and you participate in that conversation, either one, it's one or two things going to happen. You're going to win them or they're going to win you. And I wouldn't get in that conversation knowing that that individual does not have a relationship with God. So we have to be very careful how we handle the word of God. But there's a, a, a deep necessity for us to know God's word. Because when Satan comes, he's trying to distort the word. And, and, and in the society that we live in today, the, the enemy has distorted the word of God so much that there are so many confused people out there about their faith walk, about what they believe, because they're taking a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B, a little bit from column C, and a little bit from D and E, and they're forming their own beliefs and their own theologies that allows them to live in the sin life that they've chosen to live in or to participate in the sin and, and believe that God is accepting of the sin. God is not accepting of the sin. He loves the sinner right. and does not want to lose the sinner, but he's not accepting of the sin. He wants the sinner to change and turn from his wicked ways. Yeah. That's why it's a necessity for us as believers to have a command and a knowing of God's word because Satan's strategy is to take the word of God and manipulate the word of God, not causing it to be changed in such a way that it becomes a lie, but he's trying to cause deception in your mind to distort what you know. And you've got to be able to stand on the word of God firmly in your faith. So that's why we need to spend more time in these kind of studies understanding God's word and what God can do for us in our spiritual warfare. Fourth, the fourth thing that I want to share with you, Satan seeks to convince humankind that they must look out for themselves because God does not exist. So if he does not exist, he certainly cannot be trusted. That's the enemy. Because even in the garden, in this conversation with Adam and Eve, he challenged them on the word of God. But now God was not present with them. So Satan wanted them to believe that God didn't have any influence. Mm -hmm. That he was not present. He didn't have any influence. So at this point, in, in his way of communicating with them by saying, surely he didn't mean what he said, then he's trying to create doubt in the believer's mind. He's trying to create doubt in Adam and Eve's mind that God cannot be trusted. To tell them not to eat or touch 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted to make it appear that God was withholding something from them that they deserved. But I stopped by to tell somebody tonight, when God withholds something from you, it's for your protection. It's for your good. God knows what you can handle. He knows what you are ready for. Nowhere in the context of the scripture does God ever tell them that they would not be able to eat from it. He says at that present time, he told them not to touch it or to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest they would die. That was the clause. So at the end of the day, God had the wherewithal in his relationship with Adam and Eve that at some point it may have approached the time in their maturity because they were in their innocence. But in their maturity, there may have come a time just like the tree of life. They could eat of that fruit that would give them immortality. But now there may come a day when God would have removed the restriction when they had enough time with him. Can I help somebody tonight? God is always trying to look for ways to keep us moving forward in our faith walk. We are growing every day that we spend time with him. We are becoming more mature Christians. And God never puts more on you than you can bear. He will never put you in a position of a place or a circumstance or a situation that he can't bring you through. You've got to trust him. But the enemy in spiritual warfare, Satan is trying to get you to a place where you start leaning and depending on yourself more than you lean and depend on God. I wish I had just a few witnesses here other than myself tonight. I wish I had a few that are virtual that don't mind telling the truth and being transparent and just saying I messed some stuff up. Where you've tried to do it your way and your way messed some stuff up but God loved you enough that even in your mess, even when you took it upon yourself to put your hands to it and it went foul, it went wrong, it didn't do what it was, should have done. God stepped in and cleaned up your mess. Satan wants you to take the position that I can do this all by myself. I don't need God's help. I don't need God to step into my life. I, I don't need God. And, and if you take that position, then now you become an enemy of God because there's no neutral ground. You either be for him or against him. And Satan wants you to be on his team. So by you saying that you don't need God, that you don't believe that there's a God, then you take the position on the enemy's team. Now Satan can freely use you to corrupt others. We have to be aware of what he's trying to to do. Look in the text. He has a conversation with Eve, but the conversation with Eve is productive because it takes her to a place where she sees the fruit as being pleasing and good to eat. She eats the fruit, which now she's corrupted, but because she's eating the fruit, she's on Satan's team. But guess what she does? She corrupts Adam. Because now she gets him to eat of the fruit. See, Satan is always looking for a way to have influence on you, where you can get, he can get between you and God, and then take you and put you on his team and use you to corrupt somebody else. We gotta be mindful of that. Ministry loves company. Evil doers want others to work with them. So we've got to be constantly mindful that Satan is always working to put us in a position where we feel like we cannot trust God. Even in the body of Christ, even in the church, as members of the sanctuary of the congregation, Satan is always trying to influence you in such a way that you find fault in your worship that you will find fault in the process of worship, that you will find fault in the God that you serve. And if you allow them to speak to you, 
if you allow him to have that conversation and you start reasoning with the enemy, he'll prove and show you ways that you can do things on your own outside of the will of God. That's what he does best. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He is a deceiver. He's a master deceiver. He's a master of disguise. And that's what his job is. He's constantly looking for ways to dislocate or separate us from God. The fifth and final thing tonight in this lesson. Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree. But here it is. Jesus would one day be nailed or die on a forsaken tree. Isn't that amazing when you look at it? That they ate from a forbidden tree, but Jesus would die on a forsaken tree. Adam and Eve received the curse for their sins, but Jesus became the curse for other sins. That's a powerful piece. When you look at the parallels and the comparisons, everything that they did, Jesus took action to undo. They ate from a forbidden tree. He died on a forsaken tree, the cross. Yeah. Adam and Eve received a curse for their sins, but Jesus became a curse for other sins. And, and when Adam and Eve, here they are now, uh, their mortal bodies died and returned to the dust. Jesus died and was resurrected. He became eternal life. He became the resurrected Savior. He opened a door for all of us to have immortality once again. Everything that was done in this first warfare, it took Jesus to undo it. God opened a door through his son in John 3, 16. It simply says that God for so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The victory over spiritual warfare is in Jesus Christ, the gift of God. We as believers have to stay nailed to that position we have to stay at the foot of the cross where Jesus died. Our resurrected Savior is the answer in our spiritual warfare. For everything that Satan can do, Jesus has the power to undo. So therefore tonight, in your spiritual battles, you don't need to lean to your own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. That's the word. So as you're going through life and these challenges come up, though it seems like the more you get closer to God, here it is tonight for somebody, it seems like the more you get closer to God, here come the tests, here come the trials, here come the circumstances, the situations that try to put you in a place where you'll start to think in your own mind. Before I ever made this commitment to the Lord, everything was going good in my life. I didn't have these problems. I didn't have these circumstances and situations. Well, I stop by to tell you tonight, the reason why you didn't have them is because the enemy already had you. He didn't have to fight for you. He already had you. But when you decided to give Jesus your life, when you made him your choice, and you chose God, he starts to war against you because he doesn't want you to be in God's care. He doesn't want you to be in God's hands, nor does he want you to have the reward of eternal life. I hope somebody heard something tonight that you can hold on to in this short Bible study, this short period of time. Yeah, just a half hour, but God is still great in what he's doing. We've got to understand in our spiritual warfare, every day when you wake up, you've got to get up and get ready to face the battle. Yep. There will be challenges day to day in the life of a believer. There are some days when it seems like the sun is shining and everything is great. And before the day can end, 
the enemy will allow something to drop in your life to try to distract you. But I stop by to tell you today that as you wake up every morning, you ought to wake up with thanksgiving in your heart. Before you start your day, you ought to spend some time in the presence of the Lord. Because once you leave your house, you don't know what you're going to encounter in spiritual warfare. And I'll take that a step further and come back. Before you leave your house, the enemy can show up and you don't know what you will have to encounter. So I'm just telling you tonight, stay on one accord with the Lord as you're walking in step with him. Make sure it's your business to spend time in the word of God that you might know what you have in Jesus Christ. Spiritual warfare is real, people. It's, it's, it's being carried out every day right before you. And the scary part is that some people are awake, but their eyes are still shut. And, and we've got to open our eyes spiritually so we can see what the enemy is doing in the earth in these latter days. But I thank God for each one of you. I thank you for coming in tonight for the Bible study. We will continue our study on next week in defining our, our warfare. And hopefully you heard something tonight that you can hold on to. Take the time, go back, revisit the lesson if necessary. But I promise you there's strength in the word of God for all of us. As we get ready to go tonight, to those in the sanctuary, to those of you who are virtually, Pastor loves you, look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this hour of study. We thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand better that spiritual warfare is real, that the enemy is real, that Satan has a disguise. He's a deceiver. He can camouflage himself, but he only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Lord God, we ask now that you continue to keep a hedge around us. Father God, that you'll keep us in perfect peace. And then, Lord, we come praying for our sick and shut in, for those that are homebound, those that are going through rehabilitation. Lord God, even those that may be incarcerated, we lift them up to you tonight. Blessing each and every member of the Big Rock Sound Church family, their loved ones who they are connected to. Lord God, even bless those that are viewing us virtually, who decided to partner in this ministry with us. Lord God, bless their families and their loved ones. Lord God, keep speaking into their lives, helping them, Lord God, to become better Christians and believers. Just have your way, Lord God, each and every day. Lord God, we just thank you. We magnify you. We lift you up. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise for you alone are worthy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Have a great rest of your evening, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. And we're going to lift the praise in this place unto the Lord. May God bless you and keep you as my prayer.